So this is my first dev vlog for Jepscape. If you're not yet familiar with Jepscape, uh, please watch my previous video. It'll go over it in more detail. Uh, the short version is Jepscape is an upcoming modding platform for old school RuneScape. It'll let you create new custom content, and you know, as of today, supports cross world play. Um, people in different worlds can see each other, and the target is being able to support 131,000 users at once. Um, you know, and big thing I went over in my last video was the notion of uh, being able to have that many players at once and one of the biggest problems you know we see in MMOs um, you know today and you know even compared to 20 years ago is that the population numbers have not really increased all that significantly even as hardware has increased um, in terms of performance it can support. And what I'm going to be discussing today in this video is a big fundamental problem that usually keeps, you know, a cap on the player count um, for different MMOs. You know, they, they really struggle to get above, you know, a few thousand, you know, online players at once. It, you don't really find a lot of MMOs out there that can you know, even push a few thousand, you know, never mind, try to get a little bit above that. And, you know, why is that? And and what kind of problems, you know, do I have, I have to face to try to overcome that? And, and, you know, what do I do to overcome that? So that's what this video is going to be about. Um, so, you know, right now we're looking at, um, let's see, here we go. Right now we're looking at RuneScape. World 2 GE. There are hundreds of people here, uh, but you can't see them all. You know, you can take a note of this this line here. You know, they'll flicker in and out. You know, here here's one little trick that you know Jagex does to try to um, help with this. Uh, you know, too many people online at once. You know, they make some of them disappear. You know, you move a little bit over here, you know, these people over here disappear, these are not visible. So, you know, but even RuneScape can't handle too many people at once. Even with these little tricks, they can't handle too many people at once. If you've ever watched uh, Dead Man Season, for example, uh, the server pretty much dies. You know, everybody comes into one little area. And then they're all tossing chinchampas in this little area. You can click and try to do stuff, and just but you know, my own personal experiences is there's nothing you can do. And then you just end up um, in this big lag fest. You know, everything kind of falls apart. You get either lucky or unlucky whether or not you happen to survive through that lag fest. Uh, same thing goes with like some really big parties like somebody's for you know like when Link's Titan was the first to 200 mil all you're watching the server like lag because there's so many people in one little location and then so that's what I'm going to be talking about today I'm going to be talking about why MMO struggle to handle more than a few thousand concurrent active users especially in one local location. And so this is the, the MMO player density problem. This is one of the hardest problems you know, in MMOs. Um, this is, you know, this, this is something uh, that a lot of engineering effort goes into, that a lot of Time and money, and you know, something that is usually what you know prohibits you know indie game projects from getting off the ground and being able to even enter this space is this core problem. Um, and so, what I'm going to show is how I turn this problem into something that can actually scale, that can support the target player count that I've talked about. Um, and it's something that, you know, is able to be handled by the hardware I have, um, software I have, uh, and the network, you know, connectivity between, so, you know, that's really hardware, you know, 
so that that's that's kind of what I'm going to describe here. So let's begin. This is a you know lengthy presentation. So um, so the first part here is you know how do you tell n number of player client clients what and other players themselves included are doing. You know because players will need you know because basically what we're doing here even with this modding platform this is an MMO. Yeah, this is an MMO server. So it's going to have the exact same sort of problems that any other MMO made from scratch is going to have. So, you know, fundamentally, this is, you know, an O n squared complexity problem. So, you know, if you remember, you know, from your math classes, if you, even if you're not programming, you know, just think about this. As you scale more in player count, it's going to be a parabola. You know, it's going to grow really fast. Um, and we want it to, to not grow so fast, you know. So a way to describe this is think about if you had ten players needing to see ten other players. That's a hundred updates, you know, a hundred different comparisons you got to make. Um, if you had a thousand players. I need to see a thousand other players. That's a million different updates. If you had a hundred thousand players, then you see a hundred thousand other players. That is ten billion. That is a lot of stuff that um, that is, that is a lot of processing to do. Um, but for more than that, that is your bandwidth can't even handle that many updates. Um, you know, once you get to the network, um, your client won't even be able to draw that many. You know, so you know this is where we're going here. Now, the client's only able to render so many players at once. It's not going to draw a hundred thousand players, unless you had a really optimized renderer. Which I'm sorry to say that is not RuneScape. <laughs> um, and you're not going to see the entire world of RuneScape, all players, all the place, right? But, you know, even we're talking about player density here. So, you know, RuneScape, you've got only a few tiles that you can even see in your vicinity. And then you, even if you put a whole bunch of players on them, they're all going to overlap anyway. So, you know, just from a practical standpoint, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so you don't really need to see that many people at once. Um, and then the other part, is, you know, something I mentioned in my previous video was... You know, hey, we've got large game ticks, but you know that does help with with you know having a larger game tick does help compared to some other MMOs. But um, if you have it scaling and squared, that doesn't do you any good. What you really need to scale is linearly. You know, you add an extra player, and it adds. The same amount of time just for adding an extra player, but that that would be ideal. But that's not what this is. This is you add an extra player, and now that's it's it's growing quadratically. Um, so it's if you just take the naive brute force approach, it's not going to work. Um, so six hundred millisecond game ticks, you know, they help increase the potential player capacity compared to other MMOs, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, for Jebscape. You know, the minimal packet load, payload, for just player movement alone. So, so, so just think about this. Just the bare minimum of, of, of the player movement, it's positioning. You don't have the player's name, the player's world. You don't have the player model. You don't have any other information other than, hey, this is his position. This is orientation. This is the animation it's playing. And it's all packed together as tightly as you can, you, as you can get is 32 bits a player, right? So just, just hypothetically, if you took that, so we're not even talking about my entire pack, which is actually uh, 1,024 bits just per pack. Um, actually, since this is per player, so it's more like uh, 128 bits per player is, is how much I, I have in a packet, I think, yeah. Well, it depends on how you calculate it. But, but basically, if, if we were saying the, the hyper-optimized 32 bits per player, um, and then if I 
you know, did all these calculations where, you know, 131, so this is just a power of two. If you keep multiplying by two enough times, you'll get to this value. So this is my cap. So if I'm, if I'm to have this cap and it multiplies by itself, because you've got to, you know, each player has to look at this many other players. So, you know, we'll look at the worst case scenario to see what kind of lag we're going to have. Um, and then you look at 32 bits per player, and then this is really the same as dividing by 600 milliseconds. And this is reciprocal. So, you know, if you multiply, you know, you get almost two ticks per second, you know, a little bit less. So if you do all of that math, even if you were to somehow pack everything together and, 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 and really densify all of this, practically speaking, you're looking at one terabyte Sorry, not terabyte, terabit, because we're talking bits here. So one byte is eight bits, right? So one terabit per second, including the back of headers. Um, I'm sorry, but that's not, I don't have that bandwidth available. I don't, I'm not ever going to be able to afford such a bandwidth available, and nor could any machine ever handle such a bandwidth. Usually the, what you'll find on a server you know, just any individual server, they'll usually cap out around 10, 10 gigabits per second is usually the uh, type of cable you'll be able to find. And even then, the operating system, um, you'd have to really jump through a whole lot of hurdles to even try to approach um, pushing enough through that pipe, you know, to actually handle it all. So, no, um, I have, you know, if looking just at it like this, Jetscape as I've designed it would not be possible. At least as I've publicly so far explained. Um, moving on, but I'll, I'll show you how I did design it to get around this problem. But we're going to go and first look at how other MMOs have approached this problem. Um, you know. Here's, here's some basic research, you know. Um, so, you know, the biggest, well, one of the biggest, most common things you've probably heard of is sharding. You know? uh, multiple copies of the same great game world are created. World of Warcraft has shards. You know, people are placed on, they pick certain worlds and then they're stuck in those worlds. RuneScape is technically kind of half sharded, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, you can change worlds. Um, but it's still different worlds. Um, zoning. Um, so you split up the game world and then you say, hey, this server handles this part of the game world, this server handles this part of the game world. Uh, layering. You know, you automatically put players in new instances. You know, they fill up. Oh crap, this instance is full, so let's just spawn a new instance and then uh, they'll fill up there, and you know this is often handled per zone. Um, you know, it's different parts of the map, so that's kind of how it differs a little bit from sharding. Um, quad tree, arc tree. This is a approach. You know, it's like zoning, but you can kind of dynamically change where the borders are of each zone, and then this can help you better load balance um, the players. Uh, Time dilation, uh, Eve calls it time dilation. Everyone else is just say <laughs> you don't do anything. So this is basically you just let the server lag and then the tick rate um, will take as much time as it needs to finish is really what it comes down to. Um, and then another thing is uh, design the game around low density. You know, just encourage people to spread out um, because if they're spread out, not visible to each other, then you know they're not all in one little area, and that's kind of the same notion of you know zoning a little bit. But you know, if they're not all in one little area, then you cannot um, have the you know n times n kind of problems. Uh, and then you know, pretty much all MMOs do this to some extent. Visibility calling is. You just you just don't show people beyond a certain distance from the player. You know that's this one kind of speaks for itself. Um, and then variable ticking is kind of like this, but um, you tick them at a slower rate. So you know maybe the, these are updated more frequently than these 
um, more distant players. And then, you know, if they become too distant, then they're just completely eliminated entirely. And then this one is idle calling. Um, so if, you know, players just bank standing, not doing anything, uh, just don't send information about them. So, you know, these are different approaches. Um, but I'm going to go through every single one and I'm going to talk about why they don't work for Jetscape. Um, so sharding, you know, most MMOs only allow you to create a character that exists in a particular world and you're only limited, um, you're limited to that world and only a limited number are allowed per world. So, you know, in World of Warcraft you make a tune and that tune is locked to it unless you pay Blizzard to change uh, realms essentially and there's a capacity limit, like they only allow so many per realm. And then no, nobody, no more else are allowed to be created on that realm. And this is something that a lot of World of Warcraft copycat MMOs do. They just, you know, copy the same thing while did. Um, RuneScape, oh yeah, well before that we got, if too many try to log in at once, you're placed into a queue. Um, so, you know, not only do they have max capacity of, of tunes that can be created per realm, you know, per world, um, they also have a capacity limit on how many can log in, you know, everybody's got to have some kind of limit to some extent. So, this is going to be relatively low, and then, you know, once, once that limit's reached, because they can't hop worlds, you know, unlike RuneScape, then they're placed into a queue, and they get away, and, you know, it'll take however long it takes for people to get in. People hate queues. Um, RuneScape's, a, you know, kind of similar, but it's a little different. Um, whereas all of these use a, you know, World of Warcraft uses a different database that holds each player for every single world. RuneScape actually has a common centrally shared database for all worlds. So the processing happens on separate worlds but the actual player accounts are separated and exist in a you know, central location. So this is what enables you to skip that easy world hopping. Um, so whereas, you know, other MMOs have like a smaller player database for each shard. Um, let's see, and then this option for sharding, it does address player density halfway there, you know, it splits up the player population across many world servers and it places in, uh, puts in a lower cap per world. But fundamentally, it doesn't change the problem from being O and squared. They just lower N. They just make N lower. But, and so, the end result is that players may still actually lag a server if they all concentrate into a single area. Right, and then zoning. So here's World of Warcraft again. Um, it spatially divides up the world so that different threads or servers may handle the load, um, you know, separately. So, for example, you know, this creator here, you know, have a server that's processing just all the players, NPCs, you know, everything in this creator, and then um, there's different entrances that are, you know, everything's limited. You see all these mountains. They all block off these zones. Um, so, you know, they make a train movement on borders to minimize potential for cross zone interactions. So, between here and here, I'm not sure where all the entrances are, but like, here's an entrance, here's an entrance. They block them all off. So, they make it kind of hard for you to move around. Um, because there's cross zone interactions um, that end up being a problem. So these are, you know, when you're one player's on this side of the border, you know, this side of the zone, and then this other player's on this other side of the zone. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Um, but when they're on two different sides of a zone, and they're going to look at each other, or they're going to attack each other, or all sorts of things, like, that ends up being two different servers trying to talk to each other. And that can slow things down because communication is way faster inside of a single computer versus two separate computers as they travel over a network. Um, so that can lag, that can cause lag problems, that can cause um, just the amount of message passing and engineering that has to go through, that has to go with that is very expensive computationally, um, or not even computationally, sorry, but more expensive um, 
in terms of bugs, development time. You gotta spend a lot of time developing all of this communication infrastructure. And ultimately it you know, introduces latency and bugs and requires a lot of um, time to, to make. Or some, some MMOs decide, hey, we're not gonna bother with that problem and we're just gonna not allow cross-zone interactions, which actually makes it a little bit easier for them so they can just uh, never have the service talking to each other. Uh, which would actually be a bit better in my opinion, but in the end, you know, would not really work well for Jebscape, which is modeled around Rootscape, um, which doesn't have such zones. Um, but, you know, ultimately, none of this, you know, zoning doesn't, just like sharding, doesn't fundamentally change um, the problem of many players being concentrated in a single zone. You put a bunch of people on the same server, it's, the load's not going to be evenly distributed. And so that server is going to struggle. And so you can see this image down here. You know, they have different, you know, this red is one server, this blue is another server, and this purple is another server. And they're all, you know, this one's evenly distributed, which is, you know, ideal, but um, what happens when all of these come into here? Now these are underutilized and this is overutilized. So, you know, that's, that's a big problem that a lot of MMOs face. Um, the next one is layering. Um, so this is kind of similar to sharding, uh, but instead of you logging into uh, you know specific world you choose on, everybody's in the same world, and you're automatically spinning up new instances on the fly. Um, I don't know, know if anyone here has done Flash Product Factory, but the way Flash Product Factory works on, on RuneScape, you can only fit 25 people to an instance. And then as soon as all 25 are in there, a brand new instance is spawned and you know, the next 25 go there. It's kind of like that. Um, so this, you know, dynamically spawns new instances on the fly for different zones um, as previous instances fill up. Um, some zones may have more instances than others as needed. You know, so going back to here, an example would be um, everybody comes into here, so now they're gonna make multiple copies of purple um, while red and blue might turn as you know turn off, or, or maybe these would just have a single instance up. Um, so it's kind of like this, but the you know, more dynamic. Uh, where are we uh, layering? So then you have to deal with um, you know people want to play with their friends and you know clanmates, guildmates, depending on, you know what game we're talking. Um, so they have to do all of these heuristics to try to like keep everybody kind of next to each other, um, playing with each other. But you know, remember, they're not really picking their own instance or on, it's all handled and behind the scenes to try to do all this low balancing for you. Um, but you know, here's a low balance I mentioned, because um, sharding alone and zoning alone don't actually look, do any load balance really. You know, these are player decided, not automatic. So this layering is kind of automatic, giving it, you know, authority over which instance people are in to the server. Um, it does effectively solve the player density problem by having a low fixed cap per zone and it is distributed and load across many servers. Um, so this is why you'll often find this in other games that call themselves, you know, that use a mega server. You know, this is the approach that, um, you know, some of them would use, and so you think that would, might be what I use, but um, a little bit different. And, I, and I'll talk about why um, in a moment, but Jebscape does not use this. Um, and then another one that I mentioned. So Quadtree and Octree, so this is a data structure commonly used in computer graphics. Um, so an octree is basically the 3D representation here, and you have to subdivide as needed. Quadtree is like the 2D version of that. So if there's more, um, essentially what happens is if there's more um, people in a zone, you just, or in any area actually, um, you kind of subdivide it and you get like these new zones um, so that you kind of evenly split up what uh, a zone is considered. So this is spatially dividing the world, 
tiny dynamic kind of flash. So this, you know, this one layering divided it more like um, sharding, um, but did it on a per zone layer area. Whereas quad tree and oak tree, they divide it spatially, kind of like zoning, but they just redefine the borders of the zones, and then players in each border, you know, within each region, then are able to communicate more easily with each other. But now this places an even bigger um, importance on the engineering effort of doing the cross zone communication. Um, and so the way the way it's divided, it actually kind of converts this on square problem into an O n log n problem, which is not quite linear, but it's better than O n squared. Um, and you know this. This problem here is very big. You know, this, this, I don't want to understate this. This is, you have to hire a bunch of engineers to figure out a lot of the problems of having a different service architecture like this and trying not to have it be, you know, waiting, because you got to wait on a result. You know, you don't want to wait. Um, you have a real-time deadline you get to meet, and if you're waiting for another server to finish talking to you, you know, how's that going to slow things down? So, like, th this is uh, a lot of effort. Um, there's a lot of hype around it. You know, there's, there's you know, companies that like say, you know, hey, th this is, you know, this is the way uh, we're going to, you know, you don't have to worry about performance constraints. You know, hey, we made it n log n, and we're, we're going to provide um, this kind of tool for you. So I'm thinking, especially here, uh, Hadian, um, they have the Ether engine. Um, so that's kind of how they hype it. You know, that's where this picture's from is uh, Hadian. So um, they're like, yeah, don't worry about performance. We're going to go and spin up on the cloud as many new servers as you need. So every time we subdivide here, we're just gonna spin up new servers and they'll handle the, the player load. And every all of this cross border communication and all that stuff, well, we'll handle that for you. That's basically what they, they say. Um, but essentially by ignoring performance like this, um, you're gonna have your costs get a little out of control because then the server instances keep rolling up um, and what happens when players figure out how to make the most servers roll up by positioning themselves in the world in such a way as to maximize the amount of cloud usage that your company is using. Um, and so the end result is really going to be, you know, players are going to game the system and they're going to push you into bankruptcy. Uh, boss can do this or, or whatever, you know, it's it's... I don't view this as financially sustainable. Um, so that's really what this slide is about. Um, so the past four, I just talked about sharding, uh, zoning, layering, and, and you know the oak tree here. All four of these suck um, for anyone that's looking to do kind of indie MMO um, production, you know, or, or technology. So it's cost. And you know, performance and costs are deeply intertwined too. You know, and these are all distributed backends that require many servers. Um, and with performance, yeah, the more you can improve performance, the more you can reduce the servers. And if you can get everything and complexity too, if you have everything on a single server one server it all development times goes away a lot of development time goes away a lot of the complex engineering goes away a lot of the bugs goes away and a lot of the costs go away and if I have to pay to have a hundred servers a thousand servers that's that's just not financially sustainable um, unless you get a lot of um, upfront funding, you know, to, to support all this. And you need to make sure that your revenue stream exceeds the cost to keep your, your service alive. 
So you better have, you know, you better be sure that your subscriptions or um, some other games they do microtransactions, never gonna allow that in Jetscape. Um, whatever income stream you have, you have to ensure that that's gonna cover your server costs, and they're gonna be enormous with any of these approaches. Um, and then, you know, so this, I mentioned this here, you know, prohibitively expensive from a development standpoint, um, if, it, if it's very complex. If you gotta do all these complex algorithms and, and, and cross server communication in the back end and all this stuff, all this message passing, you know, that's that, you gotta hire a lot of engineers and it's gonna be tough and it may not work. You know, it's a gamble. Um, and that's what this is talking about. It's a gamble, it may not work. A lot of MMO projects fail. Uh, spatial OS does this. You know, they do a lot of zoning in their back end, and it doesn't work. Um, so that's what you know. Here, you know, MMO middleware may in theory reduce workload for you know anyone that's trying to use them, um, but they also bankrupt you. You know, spatial OS. They, uh, I, I just want to rant on them. Um, so every project that has attempted to use spatial OS has failed. Like just they've all just they got four hundred million dollars from some investor, and they just they just they can't get any product uh, released with it. So they have performance issues, um, and just the projected cost of even using it um, exceeds any re revenue. Um, so like it literally costs companies more per player than the amount of revenue each player provides. Um, so that's why they fail. And then Hadian, um, they make the Ether engine. Um, and they're all, you know, I mentioned this earlier, they all like forget about performance concerns. Uh, don't worry about that. Um, we'll just spawn up enough cloud servers as you need, which basically means your wallet. Any performance concerns you had goes immediately to your wallet. Um, because performance is unbounded, you don't care about it, therefore your wallet is unbounded and it just comes out <laughs> it comes out of your pocket until you're bankrupt. Um, so yeah, these aren't these are both incredibly expensive options. Stay far away from them. If you're considering that either of these for your own project, stay far away from them. Neither of these have had any real successful project come out of it. You know, all they've had at most is a few demos, nothing that actually ends up as a commercial product. Um, and so I said this earlier too, uh, for JavaScript to succeed, it needs to be simple to make and only require a single server. Very simple to make, you know. Um, so let's just keep on going. Um, time dilation, do nothing. So previously we looked at distributed server approaches, let's see how we can um, approach it from a different angle. So this one is you just let the lag happen. You, know, you cause a time dilation, other devs intentionally just let the tick take as long as it needs to complete. Uh, sorry, I misread that. Uh, yeah, where the devs intentionally let it um, take as long as it needs. Um, other games just call a server lag. That's really what it is, it's just server lag. Um, players hate it. Players hate it. Players don't like the lag. Uh, you know, perk of this approach is that's cheap. It uh, doesn't require multiple servers. It doesn't require big engineering effort. Uh, tactically, you know, it can support big battles if you're willing to wait and, you know, assuming you've made your server not crash uh, when it's waiting too long. So, but you just essentially just brute force it and you just let it load and load and load until each tick happens and you know it might take several seconds but you know it'll happen eventually and then you know you do your next turn <laughs> uh so eve does this you know with their big battles um in space and so people are just sitting there waiting 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 a minute or however long it takes i don't know what it is just to do each turn um and and frankly you know most private servers they go with this approach uh, so if you ever play a you know RuneScape private server or, a, or a Minecraft server or something, um, they'll lag. They just you just they just lag, um, and they just deal with it. 
they don't really do much to account for it. Um, and I think that actually is, is one of the fundamental things that holds back a lot of RuneScape private servers too, is uh, once you log in, you know, once you get too many people online, it lags so much that nobody else wants to go online past that certain amount, so it kind of places like a self-imposed cap on it with players just choosing not to log into it. Uh, and then, you know, I have bigger ambitions for Jeffscape than just accepting this low standard. You know, I want people to actually be able to do the little big battles, you know, the big battles like Dead Man, and not have the server come crashing down or, or take forever to, to load um, each tick. So, uh, low density game design, you know, like the last approach. This, you know, this isn't really a technological. You know, there's no engineering effort that goes into it, other than you know, this is how do you encourage players from a game design standpoint to not all collect in one area. So you try to you know incentivize it. Or, or maybe you try to force them. I don't know, maybe maybe you put a cap on every zone or something. Um, so you know different different ways, but same concept. You know you try to encourage people to be far away. Um, I do think actually it is a good idea to constrain the design of your game around practical per performance concerns. I don't think you should try to force the processor to do things. Um, to fit a model in your head. So, so say you came up with the game design first and then you want to implement that no matter what, no matter what the practical um, performance limitations of hardware is. I don't think you should ever do that. I think you should look at what's possible technologically and then design your game around that. Um, so as a concept, I, I think this is more in the right direction um, however, you know, it also, um, it doesn't, you know, if you're not forcing players to move far apart from each other, um, and you just kind of incentivize them, them to do so, eventually they will come together just because they choose to, and then that'll have the same problem, um, big of n squared, or... Um, if you force them apart, then you know, is it really mass a massively multiplayer game? Well, that's the question there too. Um, in any case, you know the mega server part of Jetscape, you know, being able to have um, to really be players wherever they are in the world, um, especially you know the mega server mod. So you got Roomscape. And you have people in different worlds, and there's cross world play, and RuneScape was not designed to force you apart. Um, players can go into the GE, and you can have, even if you had like 50 players in the GE on every single world, you add all of them up. Um, that's thousands of players that are all on the GE that Jetscape has to handle. So I can't really use this approach. Um, furthermore, you know, I can't fully control how, you know, any devs, you know, modders in Jetscape are gonna design their own custom content, so uh, I can't rely on just, I can't really rely on this. Uh, visibility culling, so players that are too far away, they don't get tracked. Um, so, essentially, because we had a bandwidth problem, right, remember this, we had First you, had, well, actually first you have the client problem, trying to draw everything. So you deal with that, or, or you just don't have that, you don't know, try to draw everybody. Um, so if you don't have to draw everybody, then that means you, you don't have to send their data over the packets. Um, and so if you limit the packet sizes, you know, the packet, um, the number of visible players or um, the number of players around you rather that are visible, um, you're reducing the packet size that makes it kind of practical to um, fit it on the network, you know, on that network cable, um, the NIC and, and the kernel and all that stuff. 
Um, but in order to do that kind of culling, you know, culling is like removing these um, players that don't need to be shown, you have to do a, more CPU work um, to determine who is further away from who. So you're basically shifting the problem from the packets going over the network to your server's processor. Um, so it's still n squared, it's just n squared now more on your service processor. So that's more because it has to look through every player and compare every player with every other player and be like, oh, hey, are you next to me? No. Okay, let's not show you. Okay, is this other player next to me? No. Okay, let's not show you. So it's still the same workload. Um, that said, because people don't have magically huge bandwidth on their individual servers. Pretty much every MMO out there uses this approach, you know, to some extent, um, because bandwidth ends up being a bigger constraint than even CPU time. Um, they don't let players beyond a certain distance be visible. Um, RuneScape goes even further, uh, and they cap the number of potential visible players as well. Uh, I believe this is 256. Um, I don't know. The full details of, of Jagex's protocol, I'm not really too interested in that because uh, you know, I'm not using it. I have my own protocol, but um, I, well, I think it's 256, so they don't allow even a server to tell the clients more than 256 players. Um, and so that's the most they can even view, and so they'll still try to, you know, um, they'll still try to. Uh, Look at every player though, that that's nearby. So you get every bunch, every player into a single chunk, and RuneScape's gonna look through every single player in that area and see who can see who. Um, and you can see that just from the fact that it lags. You know when you get a lot of people in one area. Um, so it, you have um, it can still be very expensive uh, as every player in a single chunk is compared with every other player in the same or nearby chunk. So even this capable lag can possibly crash on the such scenarios. Um, so this is this is a lot closer to what we want, uh, but it's still problematic. It's it's not quite there. It needs further improvement. It's still O n squared. You know, fundamentally, it's still O n squared. Uh, variable ticking. Um, so some MMOs try to make more distant objects take their update information at a slower rate than more nearby objects, uh, thereby, you know, on average, lowering the total amount sent per tick. Um, so the rationale for this is that, you know, distant, if think of rendering, you know, distant objects don't really move as much per pixel across the screen, so don't really need as much um, resolution time-wise um, for each of their updates. Uh, like having slower ticks more generally, uh, this can increase the player cap, but doesn't actually fundamentally change the O n squared problem. Still O n squared. It's just addressing it a little bit differently. Um, you know, if you get a bunch of people and one like just really coming close, they're still updating um, at that faster tick rate too. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're playing RuneScape. You know, this is RuneScape. JavaScript is using the same RuneScape client, um, and the way the world is designed, um, it may make sense in a floating point kind of world, like World of Warcraft, where you can, and you can see very far, and, you know, there are little pixels going across, you know, they, they their positions are, are um, not like RuneScape, which is tile-based, um, but with integers, where every player takes up a full tile there is no fraction of a tile you're going to be moving um, with the game update. You know, even right now, every game tick uh, is is one full um, movement. You know, one game tick is two tile moves, or um, if you're running, or one tile move if you're walking. You're not going to get any better, res you know, resolution than that, or lower resolution than that. that that's it. That's the resolution. Um, so it doesn't really make sense. You know, this variable ticket doesn't make sense in you know the way RuneScape is built. Um, it'll just completely break movement. Uh, this one, <laughs> I get a kick out of this one. So this one, 
you know, it, it's so deceptive, you know, it is. it's all like, you know, hey, if players are not moving or doing anything, let's just not send any information about that. Like, just deceptively, that sounds very attractive, you know. That would, wouldn't that help so much? But, but you know, here, here's the flaw, it's, it's just, what happens when every player decides to suddenly do something at the exact same time? That server... Great, everybody, everybody's standing still, and you're not sending any pack information about them, you're not even looking at them, whatever, they're standing still, they're not doing anything, but then suddenly, they all move, and your, your buttery smooth server goes straight to hell. This is another example of a, you know, player activity that just causes server lag. Um... You just just stay away from this. This 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 it sounds good, but it, there's no performance guarantee there. You know, just add, optimize just optimize it for the best for average case, but it doesn't at all manage the worst case very well. There's no point in, in, in doing this. All you're gonna do is you're gonna hide your worst case, and it's gonna make it harder to deal with when it actually comes up. Um, because you haven't been testing for it. So let's just, let's just remind ourselves, you know, what are my requirements for JavaScript? What, what, what are these requirements here? Um, I have only allocated so much of my budget. You know, my, my, these are, this is my personal finances I'm, I'm using to cover this. So it's only going to cost up to $200 a month for me to host. I'm using an OVH server, uh, a game server, you know, video server. That's it. I'm, I'm not paying more. Um, you know, it shall be simple and fast to develop with a single part-time engineer. I got a full-time job as a software engineer. I'm doing my own thing. This is something I work on the side on my weekends during my free time. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time to spend doing a bunch of engineering. Um, you know, and and and. Full time, I don't have a huge team to kind of do all this for me. I don't have any of these big budgets. You know, it, it, I got limited time. I got limited money to work with all this. Um, and yeah, at the same time, I want to support the entire old school RuneScape community with that single server. And I want to be able to do it without any server lag. No matter what players do, no matter how the content was made by any modders, developers, I don't want it to lag. I don't want it to be like every other piece of crap out there that you're all used to. <laughs> I want to do it better. Um, and, and, and do it better while supporting, you know, this many players, you know, up to 131,000 players. Uh, which, so really, everything we've looked at so far, you know, these requirements rule them all out. You know, this, this is what the competition has used, all these, um, these other ones we've looked at over here, this whole list, let's see, this, this whole list, we've looked at this whole list, this is what the competition uses. We're not going to do it all. Um, we can't do it all. You know, they're, they're either too costly, uh, or players can basically move themselves around and they'll draw, create server lag. So, you know, is, it, is this impossible? Is this possible? It's possible. Just got to think about it differently. Um, so, you know, let's reformulate this problem. We we gotta we gotta change the way we think about this problem. So you know, right now it's a quadratic big O of n squared problem. We have one hundred thirty one thousand other players. Players looking at one hundred thirty one thousand other players. This would be seventeen billion comparisons. You ain't gonna do that on any, any kind of CPU. You know, for any kind of visibility culling or anything, you're not doing that many comparisons. Um, you're not going to hit real time. You know, you're never going to hit your, your tick. 
target deadline. Um, so we need to convert this into a linear big O of n problem where you have 131,000 players times some constant. So this is where each player is handling a constant number of comparisons and where performance is deterministic and well-bounded, not fluctuating based upon player density. It doesn't matter where people are, we need it where we're multiplying by a constant, not by the other number of players logged in. This needs to be a small constant, uh, small manageable constant where the comparisons are manageable within our target tick time. Um, <clears throat> so this this is the the I don't know if you want to call it the secret sauce of Jepscape, um, which is not so secret because I'm telling everybody about it all. The way to accomplish this is by abandoning correctness. Um, so what, what do I mean by correctness? Uh, is this the correct result of can all these players see each other? So let's just stop caring if every player actually knows what every other player around them is doing. Just stop caring. We don't need to know for every player. Um, so if you're playing, you, you already see this a bit to, you know, in RuneScape is some players are not visible. If, if there's a lot of players around you. Like, you don't need to know what everyone else is doing. Um, let's, let, let's just think about this further. So, you know, the, the other approaches we've looked at have largely assumed that correctness of, you know, correctness was what was critically important. Even more so than real-time performance or financial cost. So when push came to shove to make an engineering trade-off, correctness always went out. So real-time performance and financial cost ended up being second-class citizens to the notion of, you know, so take the, uh, the quad tree here. I think that was uh, up here, yeah. To something like this, which is like, hey, we're gonna solve the problem of every player looking at each other. We're going to make them all look at each other, but we don't care about a wallet. That's what this is. They don't care about their wallet. They don't care about how much computing resources they use. If they're going to treat it as infinite, and but they're going to technically solve that problem or, or you know, any, any of these other approaches. They're all fundamentally the same thing. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to prioritize instead. We're going to say we are not going to sacrifice on cost and we're not going to sacrifice on performance. And these two are deeply intertwined. You know, as I mentioned earlier, if you get the performance right, you've lowered the cost. If you can get the performance to handle all your work on a single server, a single physical server that doesn't have to talk to any other servers, you've dramatically lowered the cost both to develop and to host. So these two are deeply intertwined. Um, so if these are your top priorities, you know, just like I, I mentioned here in Jetscape's requirements, this is my cost. This is also cost. This is technically, you know, three throughput, and this is my real-time performance. So these two are technically, this is performance and this is performance. So those are my requirements, not correctness. Not every player has to be able to see every other player. That's not in this list. <clears throat> so that becomes a second class citizen. So how? Do, so what we're going to do is we're going to degrade correctness as needed uh, to accommodate low cost and, and real time performance. So how we're going to do this is, is given an OV, so this is how we're going to kind of reformulate the problem. Given an OVH bare metal game server, because we have real hardware we got to think about here, right? There's real hardware that this is what I'm paying my, my 200 a month for, right? Is this bare metal server. And it has a limited available network connection uh, with bandwidth. Um, so the bandwidth is, is a little interesting. So the way this works is <coughs> um, I can do, because games, you know, online game servers tend to be very bursty. After every game tick, it'll send a burst of, of, of data and then it'll fall down to nothing. 
and then at the next game tick it'll send that next burst and then fall down to nothing so the way that this has to work is that during each burst it can go up to one gigabit per second but then on average across the entire second it needs to average 250 megabits per second that's how they've chosen to um, do the pricing and, and so and their architecture there so basically this is really the, the, the value that I need to watch um, when you start take into account hey there's two possible ticks you can have um, in any given second and so uh, really this is a value you need to watch here um, so how do I meet that target right so if this is this is my constraint I have to adapt my game or my game server here around this physical hardware constraint if I'm to meet my real-time and cost constraints um, so how can we create this architecture to to keep the use bandwidth and execution times flat while giving a best effort approach to showing as many players as possible within these constraints um, so before what well, all these other games are doing is they're putting the best effort on performance so like oh we don't know what our performance is going to be this is a best effort we'll, we'll, we'll just do the best we can do and well we you know maybe before the game even launches they don't even know what their player cap is going to be and they go well just do the best effort you know where however the player cap and performance kind of balance out is what we're happen. no that's crap <coughs> the whole reason they're doing that is because their requirements all backwards they didn't um they didn't look at the hardware they didn't analyze it they didn't um balance the way they built their game around what the hardware could do instead they had a vision of what they wanted to happen and they wanted it to be correct in their you know the way it's supposed to run in their head their vision of the game and then they tried to slap that model onto the hardware and it didn't quite fit um so <clears throat> as you can see i'm a bit critical of how others do things but I guess that, you know that's all part of reinventing the mega server. You know, come up with my own way of doing things. So um, I also made some other design constraints. Um, these, these even before I started tackling this problem, um, I'd already kind of come up with the, here are my other kind of constraints. Um, so in, to ensure proper real time performance for Jebscape, um, you know, some further design constraints have been made. Um, starting at the client, uh, no more than 64 of the players may be visible at once. And this was just from some testing I'd done uh, to see you know, how much can the client even handle. How many of these can, if I put a bunch of ghosts there, um, how many can it handle rendering uh, without having any lag? I don't, you know, I obviously the Jagus made their client, if he's written in Java, it's going to have issues. I get real light, there's a bunch of other plugins I need to run. Um, this is going to, client lag may potentially happen, could be completely outside my control, but I'm not going to write a bunch of crappy code that's going to make it more likely to happen. So, uh, practically speaking, 64 was about the number I could get of simultaneous ghosts before you started having issues with, uh, lag. You know, if you did 128 or 256, then we'll get, your frame rate would drop. So, um... 64 other good, you know, players is what you can see. Uh, furthermore, um, other players may only be visible in a 15 tile radius. Uh, this actually how RuneScape works, so you can't actually see players from beyond 15 tiles. So, so this is visibility culling. So, Jebscape is using the same concept. Um, looking at the network and the kernel, uh, this is basically the network card here and the NIC uh, performance. Um, I don't want these to fluctuate, so I have a fixed quantity of 131,000 packets that are 128 bytes each. Um, these are sent from the server to client each game tick. Uh, <coughs> so it's a you know, fixed quantity, fixed size. 
if I started changing up the size and I have to change up the buffers all the time, the, which could introduce zone lag problems. Um, but if I if I just keep every everything I'm sending to the kernel and everything internally I'm handling, if everything just remains the same size, the same quantity of packets, uh, the idea here is that the kernel should have a consistent stream that from tick to tick to tick to tick to tick, the performance should be relatively flat. You know, it, may, it may not be perfect, but it'd be, you know, it's not going to fluctuate a whole bunch. Um, then if I were constantly changing this up and trying to batch packets together and changing the size of packets. Um, <coughs> so just a quick model, you know, everything's rendering. Uh, so when I was building Jepscape, I built uh, the client side first to figure out what data I needed to draw everything and then have the server kind of contain that information as needed. So, uh, sorry, the server packets, you know, the packets from um, over the network. So the packets uh, have been divided up to contain all the data needed to draw four nearby players. Um, yeah, so four nearby players and each packet can kind of stand alone and have all the information on those four players in that just one, that one packet in case another packet's dropped or whatever, it'll still have this. Um, and then each player's slot across each tick must remain stable to draw properly. So say you have, so you have packet IDs and then you have a slot inside of each packet ID. So this um, up to 16 packets. Um, do I make a mention of that here? Let's see. I might not have mentioned it here, but yeah, I mentioned in my previous video that there are 16, oh yeah, here it is. There's 16 packets sent per player. That's the maximum, which um, times four slots per packet is 64 players. <coughs> um, so if you have packet ID number three with slot ID number two, the player that is represented on there on um, tick number five should be in that exact same slot on that exact same packet ID on tick six, seven, eight, nine, all the way up until they're no longer visible, at which point they'll despawn because that slot will then be empty on that next tick um, where they're empty and then it being empty tells the client, hey, let's just des despawn this player so that they're no longer visible. Um, and then, so between one and 8,192 players online, we just have a fixed cap of 16 packets sent per player. Um, and so below 8,192, it actually won't be the full 131,000 packets. Just, you know, at one player online, it's only 16 packets sent out. So the, this is basically where it hits full capacity. Once it hits that 8,192, it's at full capacity. So between this, technically, you know, three, and yeah, this, between these, these many players online, the number of packets sent remain constant by scaling down the available packets per player. So it always remained at 131,000 packets. Uh, and so for example, at uh, 65,536 players online, that's exactly half of this value. Uh, again, these are multiples of two. <coughs> Every player will receive two packets for eight visible players total. That would be double what these guys, which um, if it's full, if it's full population, you know, here, they get, they get one packet. If it's half populate, you know, half capacity, you know, they'll get two packets. But what happens when it's not evenly divisible, you know, by two? <coughs> um, so take sixty-five thousand, for example. That means five hundred and thirty-six of them are got would actually receive a third packet because we have some spare packets available that don't round off. That makes sense. Um, so I did my math on that right? Uh, yeah. Actually, I, I did mess up the math on this. Um, so, because of the way it works, this is actually double that amount. So, instead of 536, this will be 
1072. And I'll explain that in a moment. Um, yeah, so basically, say you were at the max cap of this, and then you go down to 71. That means one extra player will have a packet available. Um, and then you can have that one player get it. And then every, every, one player gets two, and then everybody else gets one. But then when you actually have this, um, this value, so everybody's at two, but then say you go down a packet, uh, a player, so you go down a player, because everybody had two before, that player you just removed had two packets before as well. So at six, five, five, three, five, there are now two packets remaining that then get distributed to that one extra, so you have one player less, but now you have two extra packets that can then go to two different players. Um, so actually my code already handles all this. Um, I just, when I wrote this document, I have it uh, written down properly, but yeah. So if you cut off 536, then you actually get double that since it's two packets each. So as you get lower, you know, even to lower numbers here, um, so if you had the 8192, you know, we see 16 packets sent per player. Um, but if you go to 8193, um, the way it divides out is now there's actually uh, 15 packets to most players. Um, actually, 16 packets to most players, and some players get 15 packets. Um, but more than just one. Uh, it would be like 16 or 15 different players get it. Um, so, that, you know, this is just me doing numbers off the top of my head. So, anyways, uh, that's the this design constraint. But basically, you know, we skip. We're able by doing many packets like this, we're able to reduce packets, take away packets from people um, as the population goes up, and then we can distribute them out um, more evenly. But everybody's guaranteed to have at least one packet, uh, which means people can see at least four players, um, up to sixty-four. But a minimum four, up to sixty-four max. So, you know, this is our a solution, basically, this is where we're finally getting, after this whole long video, we're finally getting to, you know, what JavaScript does. Um, so on the server, uh, each player, you know, this is what we're doing in every tick. Um, so each player must track the session IDs of up to 64 other nearby players. Um, and then before every tick starts, um, we have a freshly cleared 2D array of map chunks um, that each has a capacity to track up to 64 players within them, within each of them. Um, now, I'm just going to make a note that RuneScape defines a map chunk as 8x8 tiles, but we've to redefine it as 16x16, so we only have to look inside 9 map chunks um, to achieve our 15 tile visibility radius instead of 16 map chunks. You'll see what I mean a little bit more later but um, basically during each tick after any movement commands have been processed because we got to know where people you know where people's new locations <coughs> uh, we then you know we take this empty map chunk um, data structure and each players you know we look at each player's coordinates where they're located and we place them in each map chunk if space exists because remember they can only hold up to 64 players um, which effectively caps the number of pl other players further steps must then compare against. So this means that if 64 players are already stored in a particular map chunk, then additional players at those coordinates are just ignored and they're not added. Um, <clears throat> so this, this is going to be a, a key point. You know, what this effectively does is it, it calls... Um, it, it puts a hard cap on the amount of future processing that needs to happen. And that's never going to scale to ON squared because of this, that this has been done. Um, so we have to just loop to every player once. That's an ON task. Um, so after we've done this, we then loop over every player again. We're going to be doing this a lot. Um, but we loop over every player again to identify any existing track players that are no longer visible. So we're already maintaining a list of previously tracked players, 
and then we're going to look through that list of previously tracked players. Are any of them no longer visible? Either they've hopped worlds and they're on your world now and they're not supposed to be visible, or they climbed up a ladder, they teleported, they moved out of your, your range. Um, any, any number of things could cause a player to no longer need to be visible. Uh, they log out, you know. Uh, <laughs> then they got to be removed from the previous track player list. And then we leave their slot empty for a tick uh, so that the client knows to despawn them. So we're not going to reuse this. Um, <clears throat> and then we also, we're also checking to see, hey, did the population go up? And did we lose a, a packet? You know, we used to have 15 packets and our population increased and, and now we're only allocated to 14 packets. Well, crap, what do I do with any players in the, in the last four slots? We don't track them anymore, so let's remove them from this list. Um, we, we may add them back later because there's going to be holes that we need to fill. Because um, remember, people slot, you know, their IDs, the slot IDs where they are represented within these packets, they're not going to be shifting around, so you're not going to compact everybody to the front of all the packet lists, basically. <coughs> so you're going to keep these kind of stable. But, so we might be able to, you know, take them off temporarily and then add them back later. But, um, that's a, a rare case that's not going to happen very often. Um, any other plat track players that remain are then removed from a copy of the nine nearby map chunks. So this is, um, so we have this bigger world map and then we're looking at just a smaller cross section. We copy that and then if there's players already in it, then we just remove them from the copy. So now we're not going to look at them again and because if we were to look at them again, then we're going to get a duplicate. Um, and then any any other empty slots are going to be tracked in a um, completely separate list saying, hey, these are the IDs of the empty slots that we have available. Um, so after we've called our existing track players list, we refill it up by looking at the remaining players in these nine nearby map chunks around our player, starting with the map chunk for the player coordinates. So even though your player may not actually be stored in this data structure because um, maybe it filled up with all 64 um, <coughs> you still have coordinates you have a map chunk in error so let's start with the one that you're actually on and hey you've got five or eight or however many empty slots available in your track players list and we need to um, you know fill up so let, let's just look at we, we, we've already been tracking these players in the past. Let's fill in the gaps of, let's see if there's any new players we can follow at our track as well. Um, so we, 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 all of this work in, beforehand was with removing players from consideration that we've already been working on. And now we're looking at new players that we just want to start um, seeing, basically. And so <clears throat> we'll, we'll start where we are and then we'll kind of circle around us into adjacent ch chunks as needed. Um, and so once we find, um, let's see, yeah, hold on. Since our slot IDs must remain stable, we fill based on a separate array, so representing available slots. So yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Um, and then packets are then built on this newly tracked players list, including the upper slots, yeah. So, so basically we're, we're increasing, um, we're, we're removing people from a track player list and we're adding them back, adding new players back as um, they become available. And let me just show this in action. Um, so this is a, that was a lot of words, may have gone over your head, I can understand. So let's just kind of visualize it a bit. So first off, we'll start with an empty map, an empty world map for everything, and then we're going to look at all the positions of all players after we've determined where they've moved, and we're going to fill in all the map chunks in the player of the world. So this is just a small sample of part of the world. Um, so I'm, I'm showing, you know, so this is a 16 by 16 map chunk, and there's zero players in this, in this map chunk here, in this 16 by 16 one. And then you go east a little bit, none here, none here. You go south, you know, southwest a bit, you know, none here. We're going to have three players in this one, zero in this one, 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 six, four, five, zero. You know, you, you get it, right? 
Now, our player is actually going to be located here. You know, just in this little little corner, you know, maybe they were running from the west and they're running east to here or, or something like that. <coughs> um, who knows? So this is our scenario that we're looking at. So we've got a player here. And so step two is we're copying the nine nearby map chunks around the player located here. So a player is located in this map chunk where, so this red outline is showing the nine surrounding map chunks. So we got the one in the center and then these eight that surround it. And so this kind of goes back to where I was saying about the, um, the visibility here. So with 15 tower radius uh, and map chunks out of 16 by 16, a player here on the edge is guaranteed to not need to look any further out than this one chunk. And then this one chunk, this one chunk, this one chunk, you know. They may not even need to, you know, look very far into here. Um, but if you were to use Jagex's 8 by 8 definition of a map chunk, then I'd actually have to have them look two, two map chunks out. So you'd have to have a whole nother layer out here. So they'd have to include these three here, these three here, plus another uh, five over here, and another five over here on the right too. <coughs> um, so that'd be 16 look up. So that's that's just more um, more work. You know, it could still be done, but you know, just trying to keep it easier. So I, I defined it as, you know, 16 by 16. Um, so what we're doing here is we're making a copy because we're going to start manipulating it. So we're going to make it, we got the global world map and then we're going to make a copy of that just for our, these nine. And then we're going to work with these nine. So first off, we need to look at our current. So this is just a short list um, showing four. This will be 64 long just to handle, um, you know, as many players as I need to, but say we're maxed out in population, you only have one, um, <coughs> you only have one um, packet you're gonna send out, you know, you only have a really technically handle four in your trap players list. So we got a four. And so um, we're looking at these nine, uh, this is just showing step three up here on top, step four is on the bottom, so don't get that confused, kind of divided it here with this boundary in between here. Um, so yeah, just looking at these nine, um, we've got only four players that were being tracked by this player beforehand from the previous tick. And so we look at player five, we determine player five, which was here to our left. So we're here, we're in this chunk, in this little corner. So player five was already in this chunk. He's still in, he's still in this chunk or it doesn't matter really where he was, just that he's visible. We know he's visible. Um, still, we, t we do a, a little comparison with the visibility. We see, hey, he's still within 15 tiles. He's still visible. So let's remove him from this list because what this nearby map trunks um, list is going to be is this is where we're going to pull out players to add to these empty slots. So here. So what we're going to do is, okay, player five is still here, so we don't need him. So he was in this one. We moved him from here. So now this map chunk is zero. And, um, well, the other ones remain the same. This map chunk here, note that this one's 64 because this one got maxed out. And, you know, maybe there was 100 people here, but only 64 of them are showing. Um, so, you know, this one remains here 64. So first we just start uh, map chunk where the player's at. Um, technically, actually, this this example kind of went bad. That should be two players. Yeah, let's make that two. Then previous. Yeah, that should be two players. All right. Um, I can't modify that, can I? Anyways, uh, yeah, that. I screw that up. Delete that. So, yeah, yeah, this is two players. So the reason for this is you want you don't want to count yourself. So really, you you pull this player out of here, 
and then you, you pull yourself out of here. Um, although technically you don't have to pull yourself out of here because when you go to sample here, you see, hey, yourself is in the same world, so we're not gonna count yourself. Um, so we'll pull one player out of here, that's 36, that's not you. Um, it's the other player that happens to be here, you get ignored because you are here. Um, and then on this one, um, the way the order goes is just, you know, this one happens to be the first one we look at. Um, and so, or I think West might be, but either way, that's empty. And then this one um, will pull out uh, player 83 and 64. So we'll just go straight, you know, starting from the beginning, zero. You know, slot zero, slot one, slot two, until, you know, we fill out our track players list. And then, so now we're tracking four players, whereas before we were tracking just one. Okay, and we, we still maintained in this second slot, player number five. Um, and now we're managing to dynamically change which players we're tracking. And then that is kind of how Jebscape is able to, to do all of this uh, player density stuff. <clears throat> you know, you, you can note here that um, the amount of lookups that we have to do, and even in the worst case, is we got to look at 64 players here, 64 players here, 64 here, 64 here, 64 here, and then I don't remember the exact order, but it's like 64, 64, 64, 64. So that's it, just 64 times 9. That's the most we ever have to look at, and it is doesn't matter if every single one of these is full with 64. It doesn't matter if there's a thousand people in this vicinity. We're only ever looking at this fixed quantity and we ignore the rest. Um, so let's analyze this. Um, each player is looking at this existing 64 player track players list. Um, so that that is ON. That's linear time. <clears throat> Since we always execute at worst case performance to detain, maintain deterministic performance, um, we are always looking at all 64 player slots and all nine nearby map chunks, whether we need to or not. Um, this just keeps the performance chart flat and it prevents players from doing things that could then make it lag worse than it was before they did a certain action. So that's why we, we do it like that. So this provides a flat 576 comparisons per player, regardless of player density, which also makes it ON. Um, and, and the trick that makes all this work is that we capped the number of players per map jump that we are looking against. So we got to take this 576, we're going to add it to the 64 that we initially tracked. Um, so we tracked our existing 64, and then we're looking at... Um, 64 additional new players per nine chunks around us. So that's really 640 total. So that's this number here. Um, and so we're gonna multiply this not 131,000 by 640 instead of another 131,000. So whether there's two people online, eight people online, 10,000 people online, or 131,000 people online, it's all going to be multiplied by this constant of 640. And so in the worst case, with all players online at full capacity, our total comparisons that we have is about 80, almost 84 billion, 84 million, not billion, billion would not be handleable, something we could handle with our hardware, but 84 million total comparisons. <coughs> um, so it's a big number, but it's a manageable number. So we have one, an algorithm that can be parallelized. We can look at multiple players at the same time. And this is something that we can handle on both multiple, we have an eight core machine that we're paying for. And we have SIMD lanes using AVX2 um, that we can access for additional parallelism. And so this is a more than manageable problem that we can get done easily in under 50 milliseconds. In fact, I might be able to get it done in under 50 milliseconds on a single core. 
uh, you know, we'll have to profile that to make sure, but it, that may be um, possible. Um, so this is my target, the 50 milliseconds is my target time for just core processing. Um, and we're gonna have to put some other things into here other than just figuring out who's next to who. You know, one of these days we're gonna have to have um, pathfinding, and so that's gonna have to fit in here. I'm gonna have a whole dev blog about that too. I've got some plans for that. <coughs> um, so this is a you know server performance um, side of things, and so we basically solved that problem. It, it's not uh, something we can't handle there. And then for the packet analysis, because we've got to make sure the bandwidth can still handle it. Um, basically, you know, remember at the very beginning, we were looking at one terabit per second. We, if we do the same math and not just looking at, not even just looking at the band minimum anymore, because we were looking at 32 bits per player and four players per packet and what are we waiting or however many players per packet. I think it was <coughs> unbounded, but um, just for our current design as is, um, where we have a lot of extra space for future improvements, at the full 1,024 bits per packet, that's 120 byte packets times eight. And you know we have our ticks per second here. This comes up to 223.7 million bits per second, um, which converted into megabits per second is like 230 or 220, something like that. But it's, um, it's less than our required 256 megabits per second constraint. That's important. So we are meeting our constraint that the hardware is placed on us with this design. Um, and so we, we designed this whole problem around what the hardware can handle. And we contrast that with our initial analysis that even with the bare minimum, we have no extra memory to spare, no, um, no, no extra data to spare in your packets that was only giving you, uh, that was giving you one terabit per second. And, you know, again, on the minimal data, and even that was, yeah, that was, that was not very practical. Um, so, <coughs> we have made an engineering trade-off. Um, we've achieved our goal because we put real-time performance first but what this ended up doing is it has a cost um, not a financial cost but it has a cost um, by optimizing in that direction which is that uh, they may be future exploits that people could take advantage of with this information. Um, may, because I haven't fully found anything that's game breaking, but the, the way, um, let, let, let's just look at this, all right? So players right now can see, will only be able to see anywhere from four to 64 other players around them at any given time, while all others that may actually be there would remain invisible to them. Um, so when you're creating content and if you're assuming everybody's visible, well, that's going to be a problem. So if you're a modder, you want to make sure, you know, you got to take care when you design your content, think of how many players are going to be visible. And, <clears throat> you know, to a lesser extent, this might even affect NPCs, but I'm going to create a system where, you know, we're going to know at least some guaranteed number of NPCs are there. Um, but, you know, for this... You only gonna, you may not necessarily see everybody. You're only guaranteed to really see four, and you're gonna see. Um, and here's an important um, quality of this approach: is players will continue to only see the players they've most recently seen. So we're not. It's not like um, the instancing approach where you you see the same players all the time, and then they see you. Um, and, and, this is, you're, you're going to see only the players you most recently seen. 
And then, so if a large enough group is traveling together, say you've got 64 players who are traveling together, they're crossing the world, and they're sticking together real close, um, then they'll never see anyone else that they come across in this world. Everybody else is going to remain invisible to them. And they'll only see each other. Um, but if you're another player that happens to be watching them coming through your part of the map, then essentially you'll see them, but they won't see you. And so this, this is the most important point. Um, different players may see a completely different set of other players. Just because one player sees a player doesn't mean that the other player necessarily sees them back. So th this is a, a quality of JavaScript that I've 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 made the the trade off about that I'm I'm willing to take this as a, an aspect of it in order to achieve that real-time performance. And I'm also willing to take this that, hey, you may only see four players if the server is really full of players because we're going to sacrifice, we're going to degrade the number of players you can see and we're going to degrade even who you can see um, based on maintaining that constant performance uh, which is better than the game lagging and being a total piece of crap and unplayable right what which trade off do you want <clears throat> um so can this be exploited in pvp situations or how would you know if you had a pvp kind of um mini game in jeffscape right how could this be um Exploited could maybe maybe will this encourage people to to spread out more maybe um, so that they don't end up in, unable to see everybody you know that in that case that's certainly an exploit that's a you know trying to counter this as a an undesired bug or maybe people will try to like group up together if they could figure out a way to like get an advantage out of that I can't really think of anything off the top of my head but maybe there's something I'm overlooking. Um, but like maybe if you're not able to see other people, other players, then maybe your auto retaliate will kind of come in handy, um, you know, as a defensive measure, because I can have the server kind of have you attack them back even if you can't see them. Um, and then maybe you can use something like that to, um, and because I can determine who can see who, maybe I can knock somebody off the slides, you know, hey, you were attacked, and then because you were attacked, I'll make them suddenly visible to you now, whereas before they weren't visible, but hey, you're being attacked by them, maybe now they're visible, but that only works if you can only be attacked by, like, one player at a time. If you can be attacked by many players at a time, then that kind of falls apart, too, because then you end up in the same problem, so. <clears throat> um, but yeah, you know, th this is a feature or, or aspect of Jetscape that I want people to be aware of, um, both when they're playing and, and, and designing things, if they suddenly, you know, they don't see each other, but someone else sees them, it may just be, you know, this is an attended part of Jetscape. And so it's part of the architecture, and which was done to achieve that real-time performance and, and low-cost hosting um, and development. So, you know, Jetscape, you know, is still being developed and, uh, you know, still on the RuneLight plugin hub. If you're interested, go and play. And thank you for listening to my uh, jury voice and my presentation here. Have a good day.